Good morning, everyone. In our welcoming each Sunday, the service leader says something like, the Unitarian Church of Edmonton is a liberal, multi-generational religious community. We celebrate a rich mosaic of free-thinking, spiritual questing, individuals joined in common support and action. If we are to create this kind of community, we first need to make it a safe place, both physically and emotionally. Nowhere is that obligation more important than with our children and youth programs. As responsible adults, both staff and volunteers, we have the have a duty to our children to keep them safe from harm. That means we have to make sure the children's spaces are free from physical hazards, as well as we can make them. Uh, we also serve snacks that adhere to allergies and food um, requirements to account for this. These things are obvious. It may be important to create an emotionally safe space where our young people feel they can speak their minds, express their concerns, and share what they need to share, and know that they are respected and valued. They need to learn our UU principles, not just by hearing them or reading them. They have to have experience with the meaning of the principles from their class leaders and from the adults of this community. We have a responsibility to make our space safe and comfortable. For our children and youth, safe space and community are very important. I think it says something that when I ask the youth what they would like to do for their next gathering uh, and offer them things like laser tag and bowling, that they said they would rather have a sleepover here with board games and movies because they felt safe with this group and comfortable in the youth loft. I hope we can continue fostering these feelings in our young people and help them as they transition from children to youth and from youth to adults for them to continue feeling that they have a home here at the UCE. The quote, empathy goes a long way for sure. We cannot have healthy, loving, mature, respectful relations without it. But I'm not, we're not psychic, at least I'm not. And the intuition can only take you so far, especially when a person's sense of comfort and safety and self-worth hangs in the balance uh, by Tony Goldwyn. I feel this quote conveys our need to truly pay attention to what the young people of our congregation are saying. And still, those conversations can only be taking place in a safe environment. The CUC has some guidelines for children and youth programs and in finding volunteers and staff to try and ensure it's that environment. A few of these are, first, we have a legal obligation of duty to report, which encompasses need to report any possible harmful behaviors or warning signs. Second, each of the groups of children and youth are required to have a minimum of two adults present at all times, up to a maximum ratio of 8 to 1, meaning that every 8 children or youth have to have at least one advisor. Third, each person working with the children and youth should or must have a police record check on file at the church. My office can actually arrange to pay for that. Four, any advisor to the children and youth program should be at least 25 years of age. Plus, there's a whole code of ethics that we must follow as advisors. Our church adds some good practices of its own. We now have a dedicated regular teacher for each class to provide continuity for the young people. And this year I'm trying to rotate around all the classrooms to get a strong sense of how they're doing and what they need to, to exceed or excel. We are also committed to keeping two separate classes for the younger children. By keeping them individual and by not combining them, we are able to make the curriculum more engaging for their age groups. One place that we have a consistent need for volunteers is, this, is for a second advisor or teacher in, in the younger two classrooms, particularly the youngest. Volunteering as a second doesn't have to be a big commitment, even if you can only give one Sunday. That would be great, as the second volunteer is there to assist in the class, and you may even gain some new insight into the topics being discussed, 
because the young people often have an unbiased way of looking at things. As the saying goes, it takes a whole village to raise a child. We as a congregation, it is our responsibility to our young people to make this building a safe, to finance the programming, to keep a watch out for children when they're around, and to treat each other respectfully and inclusive, even to help out with snacks or with the kids. It's the whole congregation's responsibility. The young people of this congregation have a desire to feel connected to the whole community and not just a segment of it. So participating in Sunday services like we are today is very important to building bridges between the elder and youth of our community. If we do not strive to make this a safe place and loving home for the young people and their involvement will be short-lived and will have less diverse community in the future. Our focus cannot just be what the adults can do, but also what the young people can do to make the safe space for themselves. In the younger classes, we introduce our principles with different words to make it more relatable to them. Here to read those words are Lily and Natalia. The first principle, we believe that each and every person is important. We believe that all people should be treated fairly and kindly. The third principle, we believe that we should accept one another and keep on learning together. The fourth principle, we believe that each person must be free to share for what is true and right in life. The fifth principle, we believe that all persons should have a vote about things that concern them. The sixth principle, we believe in working for a peaceful, fair, and free world. The seventh principle, we believe in caring for our planet Earth and the home we share with all living things. Thank you. Also, our youth for the past several years have been working on creating a new covenant for each year. Here to talk about what they have been working on this for this year are Maria and whoever's going to come up with her. <laughs> As you can see, we believe in planning very far in advance. So the Youth Covenant. At the beginning of every church year, the youth write a new covenant to govern the year's activities. We start by reading through last year's covenant and discussing each item, what it means, and why it is important. Then we start building the new covenant. Most of last year's items will find their way into the new covenant in some form or other. New items will be added or new wordings found for old ones. And when we're finished, everyone will sign it. Most important is the shared responsibility to hold each other accountable for our behavior. It is up to us all to make sure that the covenant is kept. That and the fact that it is a living document. We can always go back, update it, add or change items if they're not working for us. The covenant belongs to all of us. Again, thank you. And I would like to thank everybody for their time for listening to me today. Have a good day. Thank you, Will. Those of you who were here last Sunday may have heard Will making a special announcement. Uh, this year, our uh, regional fall gathering of Unitarian congregations is going to be in Winnipeg. And that's a long way away. It's way too far for people to drive especially it's really too far for youth advisors to have to drive with vans full of kids. So Will hunted around and found some grants and asked for some generosity from the congregation and got it. And uh, as a result, our youth group will be going at the end of the month. They'll be spending their weekend in Winnipeg with youth from across Western Canada. So we like to take some time to have a community question. And the, the, the topic today is safe communities, safe children, safe adults, safe everybody. So the question, very simple, turn to your neighbor or a couple of neighbors. What do you need to make you feel safe? I don't know about you. I was really struck a little while ago as a white male. I'm sorry, I can't get over that. It's what I am. I was born this way. But I was really struck that on Facebook they had uh, someone had done uh, questioning about what do you have to do to feel safe? 
And if you look at the list side by side, women had all kinds of things like walking to their cars with their car keys in their hands or this and that and all kinds of things. A whole big long list and the guys list was nothing. I'm okay. So there is a great imbalance in what makes us feel safe in the world. So let's talk about it amongst ourselves. What do you need to feel safe in this place, in your home? However you choose to answer the question. Take a few minutes. This week, we had a contractor visiting our building. It was the annual check of our fire systems. Alarms were tested. Oy, alarms were tested. Sprinklers were examined. Extinguishers were checked out. A few times a year, a different city inspector comes by to examine the cleanliness of our kitchen. We usually pass with flying colors. On Wednesdays, several wonderful men from our church do all kinds of small repairs and upgrades and keep an eye on the general state of our building and land. And on Friday, three of our members met with a provincial energy auditor who showed us how we could upgrade our facilities and how to get some grants to do it. And every day when she comes in, our administrator, Janet, walks through every room in the building to make sure that everything is as it should be. Will spoke of how creating safe community has more than one dimension, and he was right. These building safety checks are one part and an important part of that work. But making this place emotionally safe, well, that's far more challenging. How do we protect ourselves from the kinds of things that human beings can do to one another deliberately or sometimes quite unintentionally? A church community, more than many other kinds of organizations, has a particular duty of care for the hearts and souls of the people who gather here. No alarm company is going to take that contract for us. No inspector can tick off the boxes and say, hey, you're good to go. This is an internal job. This is our job. One that starts with our principles and radiates outward through each one of us. We may want to influence the wider world, but first we have to get our own house in order. And forming safe community is our work, and it is never-ending. We begin with our vision, who we want to be in this place. The members who restarted this church over 60 years ago established a hospitable and progressive community. One where God might have been optional, but where treating one another with respect was not. And that core has stayed with us through strategic plans and vision statements and congregational meetings and changes in ministerial leadership and changes in cultural norms and expectations. Sometimes it has been a struggle to grow through the tough debates of inclusion, feminism, the sexual revolution, acceptance of diverse sexuality and gender questions. Each of these has created frictions in their time and their share of hurt feelings. Sometimes people left because they felt their well-being was not properly being respected. Mistakes happen and sometimes people get hurt. We can't always go back and fix it but we can't go back and learn from it. Sometimes our beloved community simply cannot meet those needs that fall either beyond our values or beyond our capacity as human beings. In an ever-evolving congregation, some are probably going to feel left behind by change. We can only treat one another with empathy even as we move forward in necessary steps and respect the decisions of those who feel that they no longer belong here, even if that hurts. In other words, sometimes when we listen to anguished concerns, listening generously will be all that we can do. It would be nice if it was different, but sometimes that's the fact. One of the complexities that complicates the goal of a safe community is that feeling safe is such a personal thing. What makes me feel safe 
might not make you feel safe. I am obviously an older white male. I have seldom in my life been bullied. I have never been sexually abused. I've never been attacked in the street. Well, not since I was six and Johnny Arsenault hit me in the face. (laughs) And I have had mostly really good interactions and experiences here. So I have few concerns for my physical or my emotional safety. But that's not true for everyone. Churches are meant to be places where struggling people can come for solace and support. They should be sanctuaries for the vulnerable. They should be. But one doesn't have to scan too many headlines to learn that sometimes they are not. And even if no such abuses have occurred in a particular church, we have to acknowledge that that just the very act of coming into a community where you know nobody is a challenge for some people. And we never really know how much courage it takes to walk through these doors for the first time. Some folks have histories that make them wary of new communities, of strange faces, even of welcomes that are too effusive. So how do we make this place emotionally safe when there is no one-size-fit-all set of practices or policies available to us? Well, first, we can at least begin by breaking down the kinds of things that make a community safe. The more we understand them, the more likely we are to respect them. Church researchers Susan Williamson and Peter Holmes have identified five kinds of potential abuse that can happen in a community such as ours. Physical, sexual, verbal, emotional, and spiritual. Physical and sexual abuse, and I don't mean to be glib here, but in some ways they are the most easy to deal with because they're identifiable and they're measurable. And they're simply not tolerated here. Ministers today are trained in understanding the power of their role and how that can easily lead to sexual abuse. And our association has a zero tolerance policy for that, and so does the Minister's Association. But that just covers my job. You've heard how how the two adult rule exists in our classrooms, and that guards against that in our children's program. And Will, as well, is governed by a similar sexual uh, code of sexual ethics in his job. So I'm not going to be foolish enough to say that no questionable sexual activity has ever occurred in this congregation. But I can honestly say that I and the board have never had to deal with a case of that ilk in the past 20 years. Though we did have an instance where some women were leery of an individual who made them uncomfortable with his advances. After some discussion with leaders, I spoke with him. Several others quietly started keeping an eye on him, just making sure that he was never alone with a woman in the church. We had no evidence to bar him or drive him away, but I noticed that he has not been here for some time. The community took responsibility for every woman's safety, and maybe that's why he stopped coming. Perhaps he sensed he could not fly under the radar here. Holmes and Williamson also named verbal, emotional, and spiritual abuse as concerns for congregations. Well, what might that look like in a Unitarian church? Well, verbal abuse can certainly include something as obvious as name-calling or humor that demeans a particular group of people on the basis of gender, race, ethnicity, or pretty much any qualifier you want to name. Or it might be a dismissive argument over a point of social justice policy or theology or political ideology or the budget. Uh, Your idea is stupid kind of remark can be abusive. Dismissing someone's viewpoint out of hand is not terribly respectful, nor does it further reasoned debate. 
We see that in the United States government an awful lot these days. Sadly, we see far too much of it in cable news, and it's teaching our culture a whole lot of bad habits. It's bad enough that it's there, but it should never be acceptable in a place like this that's based on respect for the inherent worth and dignity of every person. It's not clever. It's just mean. And we can honestly disagree on, well, everything. But we can also be cautious about escalating the debate into verbal abuse. Moderating this, calling out people who do cross the line, because everybody's going to cross the line sometimes. Well, most of us will. Certainly I will cross the line sometimes. That's everybody's responsibility. Directly or by informing someone else who might know what to do. And I'll discuss who those might be a little later. Now, most verbal abuse happens not in grand debate, but in casual conversation during coffee hour or meetings or social events when we speak carelessly, heedless of the feelings of who might be listening. I suspect most of us have a kind of a shorthand, a sort of spoken humor that we use amongst our intimates. We all understand what's meant instead of simply what's being said. But when we let that shorthand spill over into our conversations in public, when others might be listening, we may be doing unintentional harm. I know I've been guilty of this too many times to count. But when someone calls me on it, I listen. I take it seriously. I don't get all defensive about it. I don't up the ante like a certain person with orange hair. Because we often do not know the stories of our conversation partners or the people who are standing nearby, that verbal casualness can trigger emotional anxiety and lack, feelings of lack of safety. Sometimes you can actually see the hurt in their eyes. It sort of clouds over if they're looking. Now, I don't want to steal anyone's happiness or joy or freedom of speech, but we need to follow the Buddhists, perhaps, and engage in mindful or right speech. We must be gentle with the feelings of others in this place, for we do not always know their stories or their triggers. Now, words are also usually the tools of emotional abusers. As the youth have their covenant, it shows that there is a strong culture among them to keep speech safe and cruelty-free. Can we be expected to do any less? Cutting people down directly or behind their backs, spreading rumor and innuendo, that's emotional, emotional abuse. And it happens, and it hurts, and it damages community. A leader who leads with a my way or the highway attitude can also cause hurt and alienation. This congregation has generally been pretty careful about that, but it requires vigilance from us in picking our leaders. I have seen instances in other Unitarian congregations where community killing conflict has arisen from emotionally abusive situations. Personal antagonisms have harmed, if not destroyed, some communities. Karen Mills referred to radical hospitality our few weeks ago. She's our congregational president this year. And radical hospitality means doing what it takes to make as many people feel comfortable here as possible. It means accommodating and welcoming different views. It means... It's not your personal congregation. It's not all about you. Mission has to take precedence over personal goals or aspirations. The last item on the Holmes-Williamson list is spiritual abuse. As a liberal and doctrinally free congregation, we don't condemn as much as can happen in other faith groups. We do not appoint ourselves as interpreters of divine will. Uh, nor do we proclaim that someone is a sinner because of their sex lives or other activities. We do not shun divorcees or single parents. 
God, if we did, we'd have no one in the room. <laughs> but we aren't perfect. We do have to be cautious about our social and political outlooks. There is an old, old joke that Unitarians are just the NDP at worship. <laughs> it's not true, and it never has been. But I have encountered individuals and even small congregations in this country where that is the expectation and the norm. And I said small congregations because one of the reasons they tend to remain small is because of their political intolerance. There are members of this church who have told me that because of their views are too conservative or even too moderate, that they do not discuss politics around here. It does not feel safe. If we are to be a free church, then we have to be a free church, guided by principle and guarded by a whole community working to preserve our safety and saying, I don't care what your political views are. As long as they don't harm someone's inherent worth and dignity, it is okay to speak them here. Now, a final word on what to do if you see something amiss. You can always call, call it out yourself. And some of you are strong enough and willing enough to do that. And I've benefited from your guidance from time to time. <laughs> but some people won't feel that they can, con, uh, that they can sorry, confront uh, abuse or even unintentional speech directly. And that's fine. You shouldn't have to do so. That just makes you less safe. So this congregation hires or elects leaders who's taking, taking those kinds of concerns seriously is part of our mandate. You can speak to me. You can speak to Will, especially if it has something to do with the children's program. But if you're not comfortable with that, you can speak to a board member. You can speak to Audrey Brooks, our beloved pastoral minister. But there is one body especially elected by you, the members of the congregation, to consider those concerns. They're called the Ministerial Relations Committee. And as I said, they are elected by you directly. Their role is enshrined in the bylaws. They do not report to the board. They do not report to me. Although our first mandate is, a, is to be a way for you to talk to me, or excuse me, although their first mandate is to be a way for you to talk to me or about me or any minister, they can handle any complaints about emotional safety in this congregation. Um, the members, I'll tell you, a couple of them are here and I invite them to stand. Uh, Ruth Patrick is the chair, Graham McFarland, David Hagel, Sylvia Crow is here, and in the window in the back is uh, Kat Hartshorn. Um, you can speak to any one of them in confidence, in confidence and trust that your concerns will be taken very seriously. I have enormous respect for people who step forward and work on that committee. Try not to make it a tough job for them, but there have been times over the years where there have been some challenges. The safety of this congregation is all of our work, but there are some among us who are specially charged with looking out for these affairs. We can't do our jobs if you don't let us know about your concerns. I think the biggest failure we can ever have is when someone's feelings are hurt and they just walk away and don't tell us why. Together, we create safe community every day, every week, for everyone. Because if we don't, who will? Thank you.